Miss Hattie is a criminalistic warlord hell-bent on the annihilation of Argentina. Can I prove this? No, because it isn't true. But after months of diagnosis videos to please the algorithm, I'm desperate to make some sort of conspiratorial backstory theory, or at least figure out everything we know about a given character. The internet devoured Pixar a couple years back, and I spent the past 40 months finishing the job by sucking it dry of actionable mysteries, so despite Comcast being public enemy number one of fair use, enter Madison Hattie. Unmarried aggressor of the Gru, parody of her self-temperamental orphanage dictator, guaranteed Fifty Shades clientele. I don't know where it originated that her name is Madison, but it fits, and the wiki is riddled with it, and it has other minor details that are spot on. Question is, where is she from? What can be inferred about her past based on her known actions and personality? What can literally be proven by her details? Who is this crazy woman? Well, in the words of clickbait culture, the answer will shock you. Hello, I'm the Theorizer, and Mad Hattie over here has been my backburner focus for around a year and a half. Why? Because ever since my shocking Despicable Me timeline theory, I've been out to prove Illumination's intelligent story design. What do we know about Maddie Hattie? We'll figure out most of the answers on our way, but here's a checklist of questions. Where is she from? Why is she mean? Why does she run an orphanage? Why does she sell cookies? But finally, mystery number one may not be so obvious. Why is she so inexplicably infatuated by Gru's Spanish? Yes, when he goes to adopt the girls. Here's how it went down. He says she's beautiful, and asks if she speaks Spanish. She stares at him with displeasure and says, Do I look like I speak Spanish? He then calls her face a donkey, but in very exotic Spanish, so she doesn't understand what he's saying. And despite her stone-faced previous response to her awareness of Spanish, and despite her non-reaction to him calling her beautiful in English, this mix somehow works, implying to her that she's beautiful in Spanish. This turns around her attitude completely, and it shows that she's as vicious as she is because society has treated her poorly. She wants to be loved in a meaningful or unique way. Perhaps she was bullied, never loved, perhaps she just cannot have children, or sadly herself was never adopted if she was an orphan. It explains everything about her attitude and her 180 shift in the moment. She falls for Gru until later, when she learns exactly what he said. Point is, She's infatuated because of her shortcomings and from never feeling properly loved, but she's got more mystery than she lets on, and this was explicitly confirmed to me when I merely paused and looked at her computer. I noticed the sticky note reminding her to book salsa lessons. What does this imply? And why does the Spanish beauty of all things get to her? Well, here's revelation number one about the lore of this situation. It means she does, in fact, have a fascination with the exotic nature of Mexican-slash-Spanish ethnic culture, hence her not-so-subtle infatuation. Check. But now, let's go a little deeper with the salsa. I feel there is more. For example, did Gru know? Did he hack her? How'd he know she'd respond to Spanish? Or did he just intuit that sort of thing in the moment? Probably a coincidence. This was all very intriguing when I found and pieced the puzzle, and it pushed me to the point where I dug much deeper. I looked up salsa dancing, and immediately, something felt familiar. I recalled it from somewhere else. This happened in the Despicable Movies Elsewhere. A large mass of a human dancing and twirling around, at which point... <gasps> Oh my god, I figured it out. El Macho. Salsa Salsa. Continuity. Coincidence. Mm, no. I swear, I swear, the evidence I find and the connections I make are so damn lucky. I don't know how I consistently hit gold when it comes to events that can be tied together. Again, mind you, this tie has never been discovered, at least to the deep web's knowledge. That Argentina joke at the beginning, that was a joke. We know she is a sort of dictator, though, of the orphanage, and Argentina is not Mexico, but you get the bizarrely coincidental comparison. But here it is proven likely that Madison Hattie is not only intrigued by El Macho's Latino nonos, but that this plot point was planned years prior to his conception. The first film came out years prior to its sequel. What does this mean? 
It means, again, Illumination has continuity. It means Miss Hattie and El Macho most likely know each other, given El Macho being the most epic salsa dancer this side of the non-country they live in. He teaches this dance, and based off of both of their BMIs, it is clear that this branch of salsa is designed for their hefty weights. She has a crush on Eduardo. Gru infatuated her as an unwitting proxy to her Mexican dance instructor. He has that effect on women. Hattie used to live down south, more on that in a second, which intrigues me because it's closer to Mexico and she may have grown up on the border. Maybe Hattie has some sort of infatuation with his villainous side? I was even compelled to peg her as the little girl from the burglar family and minions, but that doesn't work at all in any way. We got the basics, let's re-evaluate. We need a little more profiling information before we determine if she's dating El Macho. Bold statement. Then again, so was the Argentinian dominatrix meme. So, detracting and going back to her earlier life, is it true that she too was an orphan? Perhaps from this very orphanage? What exactly is her reason for hosting this home for girls? Well, there's one crucial bit of counter evidence that proves her southern heritage, her accent, is inconsistent with the rest of the town. It is southern, and hence she moved here from elsewhere in the states. Childhood check. Where is here, the despicable town? Well, the phone numbers are sort of random, so we can't be sure. And the general theme varies scene to scene anyways, but it is trying to keep with the Californian theme. It's not the South, that much is abundantly clear. So she did not just grow up in this girl's home and begin to run it with age. That said, if her ownership of this orphanage has a distinct reason, that remaining reason could be that she felt the need to protect and raise large amounts of children. Again, this could have been caused by many things, such as losing a child or the inability to have children, and thus she intends to live vicariously, or at least she did it first. Now the stress is to her detriment and she's learnt she does not enjoy raising large amounts of children. It's a devastating reality, but it could be possible she had a fiancé or some sort of pre-Mrs. love interest with whom life crumbled at the least apt moment possible. Depression. Check. So she opened her orphanage after immigrating intranationally, but was ruined by the stress of what we see to be debt from the money she doesn't have. This is severe, to the point of lowering heating costs, stripping the rooms to nothingness, eating away her troubles through cookie salesmanship, and, most intriguing of all, from the pixelated 2010 animation I can make out roughly what appears to be another resume on her desktop from another doctor. That's an easter egg reference to the director of the film, but the point is, it says doctor, implying she's highly willing to accept adoption payments exclusively from what she perceives to be the wealthy. Something Nefario or Gru may have known. Salesmanship. Check! She wants the money in part for her salsa lessons, but has the girls in ballet, which means it's possible that she does sponsorships or promotes the cookie salsa ballet something for the more money she needs because cutting the heating bill really isn't cutting it. Check. Her hair looks as if it's cut at the Eagle Hair Club. Her rose looks as if she's given it to herself, or a poor little orphan girl did it for sympathy, though she wouldn't care. We know Hattie too well by now. She's registered with the Orphan State Database and says, I love reading, like the sardonic sardine she is, and yet has not been inspected under charges of abuse. The girls are allowed to keep selling cookies for her after leaving the orphanage, presumably to monetarily aid the kids remaining there, but is it her brand to begin with? Vector recognizes the cookie names offhand, so does she illegally rebrand them, or is it just the way this system works? What lengths will she go? What people on this checklist are being sold these? Does she work with someone else? It could be assumed, given her, please tell Margot, Edith, and Agnes to come to the lobby. Who's there to receive that message? An assistant? Why have they not reported this royal ass hiding? Maybe it's the ballet teacher? I looked through the whole script online. Nothing. These cookies have very strict Hattie-esque phrases on the front, but they seem to be independent brands. Basically, she's a little desperate. But we see more consistency. Regarding the ballet, the recital is on Saturday, May 26th. That date occurred in both 2012 and 2007. They probably planned out the film around 2007, hence the calendar's format. It was released a few years later, but 2012 fits perfect when you consider that Lucy Wilde's new car has a 2014 sticker on it, and the films take place about that time difference apart. Not 2013 when the sequel was released. See? Intelligent design. So Miss Hattie's details cannot go unnoticed. I've done much more than just figure out the film dates though, just consult the other despicable theories I've devised. The ballet company seems to be registered under a different name, as it is not Miss Hattie's company. I even began to propose that Lucy Wilde, also voiced by Kristen Wiig, was posing as Hattie to spy on Gru, or that somehow El Macho's son is involved in the evil plans, and Hattie is his mother, and did in fact speak the donkey-faced Spanish she denied, but then I stopped. 
sat back and realized, that is nuts. We have everything we need for a baseline, because now that we have Miss Hattie's life, a little of El Macho's, and a lot of Gru's, Nefario's, Lucy's, and Scarlet's, we can solve anything and know if it fits or not. With that said, happy 2020 indeed. I might cover her more or do a little recap later. My schedule has fractured and fragmented. Apologies, I will not fix it. Subscribe, hit the bell, I'm the Theorizer.